So uh, thank you for having me um, and thank you to Digital Futures um, for hosting me in this forum. And thank you to everyone here for, for being present uh, uh, today. It's an honor to have an invitation to a forum like this, and I'll be speaking about my ideas sort of from my book against techno-ableism, but also in relationship to a series of cases I don't discuss in the book um, that feature the use of digital technologies um, so that we can talk about techno-ableism and ableism in the realm of AI and other, and other ways in which being a technologized disabled person um, puts you in a weird position. So I have my first slide today where Matt Dowell, um, who is my friend on Twitter, um, uh, posted last night, my new medical device says on the lock screen, this device is managed by your organization. And I have no idea who that organization is. Big Pharma, question mark. And um, he was kind enough to send me a picture of, of the device. Um, um, that he uses to manage type 1 diabetes. And indeed, indeed, it does say this device is managed by your organization, but he doesn't know who that organization is, right? What is it to be a technologized disabled person? Um, it's to be subject to particular forces. So uh, there we go. Um, so this is actually my title slide, even though I've started someplace slightly different. I want to tell you that this is a disability forward presentation. So I ask that you feel free to make your body mind comfortable as I talk. You can stand up, sit down, sit how you like. And in fact, since we're on Zoom, I won't notice. Um, you're free to move around. I'm glad you're here and it won't offend me uh, for you to make yourself more comfortable. It's an honor and a privilege to be in community together and we should welcome each other's comfort. I'm happy to take questions um, from the chat or by unmuted voice um, or be stopped at different points in this presentation if that is what is desired. I'm going to be talking about being disabled. That is the experience of being disabled. Elizabeth Barnes in her work, The Minority Body, talks about disability as mere difference, even though people often take it to mean bad difference. Um, this means that not all disabilities are causing problems all of the time, right? This doesn't mean that some people don't experience pain and displeasure from being disabled, but to think about disability as only a bad thing or as something that is necessarily bad is to, is to get the story wrong in some sense. I start from a commitment that disability is always a political and constructed phenomenon. For instance, amputees have always existed. You can find us in the fossil record, but how our bodies are understood and seen as a group and as part of a disability community is a much more re recent phenomenon. That blind people, amputees, and people with such far-flung disabilities as bipolar, dyslexia, ADHD, and, and more all belong in the same category is a more recent idea. Uh, one that's been very much shaped by ideas about work and productivity. Um, and disability is also strongly cultural, which means that I'm not sure how much I'm saying uh, will resonate with an international audience. Uh, when I say disability is cultural, I mean, for example, that disability would, that dyslexia wouldn't be a disability or wouldn't be discovered, except where literacy is common. When most people were illiterate, dyslexia wouldn't have been recognized nor considered disabling. It wouldn't keep you from participating in a society where everyone else is also illiterate. Uh, people are disabled within a context. That context is historical, cultural, and always changing. Disability is cultural means that what we consider disability um, influences how we treat disabled people, both individually and through infrastructure, policies, and law. I also want to recognize that I run the risk of this presentation not landing with this audience um, in quite the way it does with the North American audience, since much of my source material and historical study uh, for this particular book um, have been in English and in the context of the United States and some Canada and a little bit Great Britain, so English-speaking countries. Um, disability is also a natural part of human existence. What we currently call disability is a natural and common part of human biodiversity. Estimates on the amount of people who would count as disabled sits around 15 to 20%. And disability is part of every type, other, every other type of diversity that exists. When I talk and write about some of these topics around techno-ableism, I want to admit that I am very privileged and I'm talking to you all now, wow, um, um, that reflects some of my privilege, but I'm also very worried about ableism. I'm insulated from some of it by my job, 
Uh, the types of disabilities I have, most of which are somewhat less stigmatized than other types of disability, by the color of my skin, certain presumptions are not made about me in the way they may, would be made if I had darker skin by being a woman. And therefore, I'm sometimes freer to talk about my own disability and my own vulnerability in ways that I um, wouldn't be as so socially compelled to do um, if I was expected to appear rugged and masculine as possible. And by my line of work where I can set my own schedule and make my own doctor's appointments at will and where being absent minded as a professor um, isn't nearly so problematic, uh, but it's not the profession for me. It is long term cognitive changes from chemotherapy. But I'm researching technoableism and ableism more broadly. I recognize the specific ways in which I'm vulnerable in ways many people don't have to think about daily. I'm much more likely to be scrutinized to have my children taken away if I'm judged unfit. I worry every day that my prosthetist will retire and I will never have a decent leg again where I can walk without pain. I worry about appearing too non-disabled and people denying supports that I use like disabled parking and accommodations around where I do my work. I worry about different types of tracking not capturing me correctly and being used against me. Something as simple as a step counter can rule me in or out as healthy or active, even though my steps probably aren't a good indication of that. I know how quickly things can be denied or taken away. This is what a lot of disabled people feel pretty acutely, even those with some societal privilege like I have. To tell you what my disabilities are, I'm hard of hearing, chemo brain to amputee with Crohn's disease and tinnitus. Um, so I know that I'm also not the subject of many research studies around disability. I'm confusing, like many of us are, because so many of us are multiply disabled and therefore are not captured by most disability research. The fact is that most development and research around disability asks us to have one type of disability to the exclusion of other types of disabilities, even though there are many comorbidities with different types of disability, which means that our research doesn't really reflect what most disabled people experience. So my larger project uh, with against technoableism um, is to talk about diagnosing the problem of technoableism a phenomenon where helpers and medical professionals and engineers offer their ex expertise to help disabled people, where ableism is often re-emphasized through these encounters uh, with the technological and medical solutions disabled people are offered. This is often wed to an idea that disabled people want this intervention and will be empowered through a technology or approach, with the background assumption being that disabled body minds are broken, suboptimal, inferior, and somehow like calling out for help at all times. My work is focused on this concept of techno-ableism. Ableism, as Fiona Kumari Campbell writes, uh, is a trajectory of perfection that shapes our systems of value, worth, and well, nearly everything. It has shaped your education and who your classmates are. It has shaped where you're located and what you read. Ableism involves attitudes and individual biases, but goes beyond that into our infrastructure and all of the ways we think about life. I trace a particular strand of ableism in looking at techno-ableism, um, where people are forced to, in how Tanya Tichkowski calls us, includable, be made more includable, worth including through technological means. Um, there are dangers into being both fit for AI and in, uh, in being unfit, unmade, um, not being seen. So both being hyper visible and extra scrutinized and less visible, therefore not taken care of or not supported in the way you need to be. In addition, there are many dangers to having body parts owned, managed and maintained by companies or managed care um, to be cyborg, that is to be a disabled technologized person, is to be tracked and surveilled as a regular feature of your life. Whether the techno whether the development's intention, you know, reflects uh, particular ideas about disability. Um, and we see technoableism reflected in media accounts of disability technology. Take, for example, and here I'll give you, uh, here's T.L. Lewis's definition of ableism, which of course, tells us about this sort of construction, right? These constructed ideas about who's normal, productive, desirable, intelligent, excellent, fit, um, are very much rooted in eugenics 
anti-blackness, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. Um, and I think it's really interesting that T.L. Uh, Lewis points us to you know that you don't have to be disabled to experience ableism either. So here I turn to the Bill, Bill Peace, the bad cripple, um, who tells us a little bit about receiving some of the societal messages about disability. Um, and I'll read the quote um, from his blog, which is called The Bad Cripple. Your typical bipedal person exposed to a barrage of misleading news stories is led to believe all paralyzed people share one goal in life, walking. Please cue the soaring inspirational music accompanied by the brave and noble young man or woman struggling to walk, surrounded by healthcare professionals, computer scientists, and engineers who share the same ritualized ideal. The flip side of the obsession with walking is not discussed. No one wants to talk about the gritty reality. People who cannot walk are forced to navigate. No one wants to think about the barriers to healthcare and appropriate adaptive technology. Disability must be placed in the larger societal, historical, political, and medical context. It requires a new way of looking at disability. The ritualized ideal um, here that he's talking about is to think about walking as an absolute good. I can say more about this later, but walking is an instrumental good. It gets you places. It's good for what it does. It's not the only way to exist in the world. It's not an intrinsic good. It's weird that so many people fixate on something that is instrumental in a person's life. Um, and here we're talking about something that, that may or may not embed AI, although a lot of these systems um, that move your joints in particular ways do, um, do some machine learning um, or are tracking you in ways that will be used to analyze um, the way in which you walk and move. Um, I place some of this in, in the work that exists already on bias in AI. I think here of the work of Sophia Noble, Meredith Broussard, Rua Benjamin, Damian P. Williams, and more, um, who work on, on bias in AI, particularly around racial categorizations and gender categorizations. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about bias in the case of disability. So here are some headlines, um, uh, various reports and, and writing about sort of um, why we need uh, disabled and marginalized perspectives in AI research um, and talking and highlighting some of the pitfalls that could come um, when we think about, when we think about how, what, what AI will mean for disabled lives. There's, of course, a lot of work that highlights other forms of bias, um, especially around facial recognition and otherwise. Um, the Whitaker et al. paper details the expected outcomes from, from some of these, these programs, uh, problems we know exist in data sets fed from criminal databases. And um, we know about autonomous vehicles who can't see wheelchair users or scooter users because the way they move isn't read correctly, like what it is to move in a way that's unexpected, presents particular problems, like very practical problems um, for how people move in the world as we continue um, to add AI uh, to different forms of, of city life, right? If we're talking about cars moving on streets. Um, but the issues with AI go beyond these things. Um, we need to be able to recognize techno-ableist AI systems because we know how often categorization messes us up in the world because of disability and how often tech solutions often are more hyped um, than what we would hope for. So as a cyborg critiquing AI here, I wanna note that one, the cyborg figure as a hybrid was about resisting essentialisms, especially through like ecofeminism and things like this, resisting categorization, resisting simplification. The current contemporary cyborg is asking for this as well. To have a cyborg critique of AI is to have a critique that pushes back on the notion that we are categorizable and exportable as data at all, right? Resisting this notion. Second, I also consider the lived experience of the cyborg body mind, those of us who are already technologized due to our disabilities know more about living with, depending on and negotiating the world through technologies than non-disabled people do. We know the danger of power, power outages, our lives at stake if we use ventilators or facing inconvenience if different parts of ours plug in to charge. Our lives are tied up, tied into the grid uh, with technologies in non-trivial ways, ways that 
very much impact our ability to live, our ability to leave our homes, our ability to participate in education and healthcare and all facets of life. Technologized disabled people have been with and part of us for all time. Disability is not a category to eliminate. It feels weird to have to say this. We should be expecting more disabled people in the future with climate change and environmental change and new weather patterns and changing zoonotic diseases because of weather. It's worth anticipating disabled people, include, including us in projects of all sorts for our survival. I'm happy to also say more about this. But first I wanna give you some background into what it is like to be a disabled person and have your body read in various different ways. Um, depending on where you go and what you do and demographic features you have. So I talk about in one of the chapters of my book, Common Tropes About Disability. These are not an exhaustive list. These are the ones that I see most often uh, part of technological conversations, sort of as an underlying subtext in a lot of uh, technological conversations that people regard disabled people as like pitiable or, or, or freaky right, that they, they defy particular categories, and that is a problem, right? We, we owe them our pity. Um, second, that we're often depicted as moochers and fakers um, in the world, um, that we are asking for too much, or that we are not really as disabled as we say we are. This is used to deny benefits. I think about all sorts of benefits analysis and screening, which I'll loop back to in a moment, um, that, that are always policing any system set up for disabled people because the belief is that so many people will pretend to be disabled. There's actually a really low level of that happening. Uh, bitter cripples um, is a third trope um, that emphasizes the way in that like emphasizes that disabled people are bitter about being disabled and therefore we don't have to listen to them um, um, and you know dismisses uh, disabled people in a particular way, especially if they don't agree with the technology that we're making or if they have critique about the thing that we were trying to make for them. Um, for the shameful sinners that some people deserve their disabilities. Um, this is part of a lot of dialogue. I think a lot about um, how HIV AIDS was depicted in the 80s and 90s. Um, and how people were like described as deserving their disability. And then fifth is inspirational overcomers where disabled people are always seen as inspiring um, and, and, and heroic for you know, existing um, as if that were an achievement by itself. I always like to illustrate these through tropes, um, these th through uh, memes. So looking at some of the things that get passed around on social media about disabled people, um, the sort of top two left ones are depicting uh, pitiable freaks. So um, the first one has a young man in a suit and a woman in a power chair holding hands. And the inscription says he asked her to prom even in her condition like in Jerry equals respect. Um, as if it is notable when a disabled person gets asked on a date and becomes newsworthy. Um, and then the person who asks them on a date is like praised as being like a particular champion of disabled people for interacting with us as if we're people. Um, the second, um, and here is a screenshot uh, from YouTube um, that has a boy on a bench, and it's the I Am Autism commercial by Autism Speaks. If you've seen this commercial, it narrates, um, has like whooshing air, and it says, I am autism. I will make it so that you never get to dine out in public. I will cause your divorce. I claim more children than pediatric AIDS cancer and diabetes combined, as if those are comparable categories, as a really scary voiceover. And it, it paints autism as particularly tragic in ways that um, a lot of autistic people talk about Autism Speaks as a hate group um, for promoting um, sort of a very negative image of, of autism. And one that for autistic people who exist in the world, when people have only been informed by commercials like this, um, think that your life is tragic um, and that you might be better off not existing, right? Uh, part of the worry there. Um, I have uh, uh, a, a shameful sinners uh, a trope uh, in the uh, right-hand corner. And yes, I am doing right and left fingers here because I can't tell my right from my left. All right. Um, and it says new frosted flakes with marshmallows, uh, free diabetes in every box, right? So the idea that this man is earning his diabetes through eating sugary cereal. Um, I, I see a lot of um, 
shameful sinners play into how we talk about things um, like obesity, how we talk instead of looking at sort of the societal picture in which all of this is happening, it instead turns it on individual people. I acquired most of my disabilities due to cancer treatment and people would always ask me like, what caused your cancer? And I don't have a cancer like that was caused by anything. I had osteosarcoma, which is something that's been found on dinosaur bones and uh, rates of osteosarcoma are not particularly growing. Uh, but the idea with that question was, well, what did you do to deserve this particular cancer? Like what, what brought it about? And you see this, you know, really harmfully uh, to people who, um, Whose, whose cancers um, have those sort of attributions and end up being treated worse um, in social environments, right? Uh, below that, we have Snarky Wonka who says, bless your heart trying to get disability benefits. I don't think lazy is a disability, right? So to suggest that anyone applying for disability benefits who doesn't look disabled enough, which there is no look of disability, by the way, uh, means that um, a lot of people are heavily scrutinized. Um, I know lots of people who wanna use like disabled parking tags um, and if they don't appear disabled enough, um, like are yelled at in public and are worried about being insulted in public. Um, if we flip to the other side, uh, we have Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump who has no legs. He is an example of a bitter cripple, but also we see this happen with all sorts of disabled uh, villains. If you look at a lot of uh, sort of film, novel, uh, and, and plays that feature disabled character uh, characters often those characters are villains right particularly facial scars and hand amputations um i would like justice for captain hook um for instance um where people are are seen as being particularly bitter um about their disabled state and in the middle here this might seem better um is this quote the only disability in life is a bad attitude you see this overlaid off of lots of pictures of people with running blades. In this case, it's Oscar Pistorius, who we you know was a murderer now. Um, but the sort of idea that the existence of disability is you not trying hard enough, right? And that disabled people are here to inspire you to, to get more exercise or do these sorts of things, um, um, usually in sportsy ways, um, to overcome their disability. And this is the quickest way I have to show you that these disability, that these disability tropes exist. Um, and a lot of it reflects a sort of deep, like worry that disabled people, if we look back at these, that there's no good way to be disabled, right? The sort of narrative tropes that we've been given um, suggest that disability always com constitutes something a person needs to compensate for or negotiate with or deal with like on their own, right? It's thrown back to them as an individual problem. And of course, this individual problem is often taken as a technological problem. Right? How do we help these people? Well, let's provide them better technologies as often. Um, um, the sort of response and the cyborg Jillian Vice uh, reminds us that this impulse, you know, is a very non-disabled one. Um, Cy writes, they like us best with bionic arms and legs. They like us deaf with hearing aids, though they prefer cochlear implants. It would be an affront to ask the hearing to learn sign language. Instead, they wish for us to lose our language, abandon our culture and consider ourselves cured. They like exoskeletons, which none of us use. They would never consider cyborg, those of us with pacemakers or on dialysis, those of us kept alive by machines or made ambulatory by wheelchairs, those of us on biologics or antidepressants. They want us shiny and metallic and in their image. The cyborg Jillian Weiss uh, distinguishes in in size work, uh, cyborgs from triborgs, triborgs who think uh, the future is going to be a, a sort of a magical one and that if we just hold out, we'll have better technologies um, that will help us compensate uh, for, for disability in some way. The loudest opinions on AI futures are from triborgs. So some of this might be jarring to hear that there are disabled people um, who aren't like thrilled uh, with being told what they need and how to measure up. Um, even when things are going wrong, of course, in a science fiction scenario, we are often told to be impressed by AI and its power. Ooh, I lost my, there we go. I write in my book that the sharper end of techno-ableism 
is that if one cannot measure up by technological means, then there are technological eugenical means for dealing with the most unfortunate cases. So when we think about disability and technology, um, prosthetic legs, Prozac, pacemakers, ostomy bags, fidget spinners, heating pads, and wheelchairs are technologies for disability, but so are gas chambers, institutional confinement, and prenatal deselection. Um, it's a short road from being deemed unincludable and unredeemable to being actively excluded and harmed or forgotten in our technological systems. And so we need to center disabled people as existing in the futures that we imagine, but it's not enough to do just that. We need to be in the business of anticipating that, that the data that we have, the data that we have and that we feed into our systems often misrepresents disabled people, fails us, or puts us in positions that are much more precarious because of the surveillance they bring. We need to slow down the rush towards more techno technologized things, especially when we know we have failed in this arena before. So I have just a series of cases to give you at this point forward um, um, in the presentation. There's a rhetorical strategy here that is similar to the work of Benjamin and Broussard who hit you with case after case of racism because of algorithms, um, but I can't cover all of those, uh, like all of our cases in a shortest talk, uh, but I do want to stack some cases on so that you understand what it is to have a technologized disabled body and to be perceived or not perceived um, or known or not known or have data that doesn't represent your societal opinion that traps you in a particular way. I understand that like white supremacy, ableism is embedded in so much of what we do in sort of pernicious ways. You can be well-meaning and you can be trying to make good things and still do incredible harm here. So let's jump to some cases. The first is the case of electronic visit verification. Here I have a headline of one of the few articles written about electronic visit verification, which is a US system right now. Um, but I know uh, sort of the makers of the software for these things are looking for other cases. Um, and electronic visit verification um, is, is a system where if you need attendant care, um, you have to have a cell phone or some other sort of electronic device with you, possibly at all times, so that your care workers can clock in and out. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a time card system, but these particular systems track where people are at different times and represent a sort of surveillance of disabled people receiving the, like receiving this service that goes beyond what most normal citizens would expect. Um, and in fact, um, in this article, they tell us EVV ostensibly aims to reduce waste, fraud, and abuse in the Medicaid system. Medicaid system is a system of um, care and insurance for people in the United States um, and abuse in the Medicaid system by requiring that caregivers of disabled people prove that the covered individual is actually receiving their approved care. Under federal law, all states must require that health and home care providers utilize some form of EVV. If they do not, they risk a reduction in funding for their Medicaid programs. I was so excited that this article came out at all because this is a conversation that I've seen on Twitter between disabled people talking about their worries about electronic visit verification that doesn't hasn't made it into a wider sphere. It's taking all of this additional data and we can imagine what will be done with this data um, and we, we actually have a lot of outcry, particularly from uh, trans people who receive, um, who might receive attendant care if they are also disabled, um, who are worried that their locations will give them away for, for being trans in ways that might actually harm them um, and, and might make them more subject to abuse uh, from their family and other caretakers. Um, this article also tells us that while well, EVV was initially required as an attempt to prevent benefits fraud, uh, whatever preventative benefit it may provide, most of which uh, seem to be largely speculative, largely outweighs its detriments. On the financial front, and this is a quote, according to The Guardian, the state of Arkansas secured only three convictions for personal care services fraud in 2020, recovering a total of $1,930. As of mid-2021, EVB had cost the state $5.7 to implement, right? We're so worried about fraud that we're actually like wasting a vast amount of, of, of money um, to put in place some of these systems too that essentially track disabled people. A lot of data about people's whereabouts and activities put them at particular risk 
right? Especially if they're already subject to um, abuse or have stalkers in the system. Um, the authors of this also worry about cyber attacks and data breaches that could put disabled people who need to use EVV to get proper care at additional risks. Um, next case. All right, second site. Um, so second sites, Argus 2 neural implant, let people with some types of blindness see light and dark in shapes. Um, so it was implanted, and here I'll read from this article, more than 350 blind people around the world with second sites implants in their eyes find themselves in a world in which the technology that transformed their lives is just another obsolete gadget. Um, so second site, um, discontinued the retinal implant um, that more than 350 people had um, had implanted and was helping um, them see dark and light and shapes. Um, and in fact, some people had very dramatic times in which Second Sight just stopped working and they were out and about like trying to cross streets um, and things like that. Um, and they decided not to continue to fund it, service it. It became obsolete. So this company, um, um, nearly went out of business in 2020 and it discontinued this retinal plant in 2019. Um, and, and now the people who have it implanted um, are slowly losing their ability to use this, um, especially without an upgrade or anything like that ever being in the works again. Um, and this article tells us one technical hiccup, hiccup, one broken wire, and they lose their artificial vision possibly forever. To add injury to insult, a defunct Argus system in the eye could cause medical complications or interfere with procedures such as MRI scans, and it could be painful or expensive to remove. So they got these bionic eyes implanted, um, but they're now obsolete, unsupported, unable, um, unable to, to have them serviced, um, and in fact, can cause all of these secondary problems and issues. Um, even though we're told to be excited about new disability technologies. Here are two, it's hard to be excited about. Here's a third one, um, cochlear implants. At one point, um, there was a special cochlear implant uh, designed to be low cost and offered through an Indian medical program to lower income um, Indians um, who had children um, they were mostly implanted in children um, who were experiencing deafness. Um, and in, in these cases, um, the Indian government bought a whole bunch of these um, and, and indeed uh, paid for them. Um, the particular story that I'm referring to here by Michelle Friedner um, follows one boy who had it implanted as a four-year-old, was suddenly able to um, hear more, was learning through it, um, and by age eight, um, the company had decided to go another way and not support these devices any longer. Um, and because getting the cochlear implant meant not following other technological paths, right, or other adaptive paths like sign language, it meant that that a lot of the people who had gotten these, and here's the quote, had become dependent on a single medical device and by extension on an entire multinational corporate system whose financial goals seem to contradict comp company's aim to support clients hearing over the course of their lifetimes. Um, the author critiques the term planned obsolescence, which was part of what these cochlear implants, um, uh, you know, planned obsolescence was part of it, that you're going to need upgrades over the course of your life. Um, and Michelle uh, Friedner um, talks about this as planned abandonment, when you don't plan to continue to support a particular technology over the course of its lifetime and over the course of the lifetime of the person with whom the technology is implanted in. And of course, people can choose to undergo a uh, surgery to get a new cochlear implant system, but it's a literal, like, it's a major surgery um, to do this replacement. And if we're talking about lower income patients in India, we're talking about people who couldn't afford the first one to begin with even though that's how this particular cochlear implant was marketed and understood. All right, the Dexcom outage, there we go. 
Um, the Dexcom outage was when um, Dexcom is a system that monitors your blood glucose that is used for people with type 1 diabetes, including a ton of um, type 1 diabetic children. And there was a blackout, um, a computer glitch that sent um, Dexcom down um, uh, for the course of like a three day weekend. Um, and a number of people like uh, were like discovered in their beds, unable to um, like get up because it wasn't like sending the warnings um, of a blood low blood glucose that people would have normally received on their phones related to this monitoring system. And, and there was a huge furious outcry um, um, from parents of children with this particular technology um, who relied on this relied on this um, um, to to let them know if their kid was doing okay, right? Um, there's also the case of Rita like it's brain implants. So disabled people are often seen as like test pilots for various different technologies. And in this particular case, um, it was a great brain implant. It changed her life. Um, um, and the person here is Rita Leggett, who's an Australian woman who received an experimental brain implant to help with her severe chronic epilepsy. Um, it involved a handheld device connected to a brain implant that would tell her when a seizure was coming. She had severe seizures, and knowing when her seizures were coming changed her life dramatically. She could know when she could leave the house or when she needed to go sit down and rest um, and let a seizure pass. It was implanted in 2010. But in 2013, the company NeuroVista, which no longer exists, told participants who were in this trial about this brain implant um, to have their implant removed because the company was failing and wouldn't be able to monitor or take them to even get the sort of approval that it would take to get this device sort of a large scale released. She was, Rita Leggett was the last participant to have hers removed and it was very much against her will. Um, and she had talked about how this technology had become part of her life in very significant ways and how she couldn't imagine her life without it. So here we have the case of a good uh, a technology someone really likes and enjoys, just like Dexcom. But it's sort of technological failure leaves disabled people particularly subject to the whims of corporations in ways that very much affect our lives. We have the Spectrum 10K controversy, which was the largest study of autism in the UK involving 10,000 autistic individuals of all ages and abilities, led by Simon Baron Cohen of the debunked extreme male brain theory. It was paused in 2021 due to backlash and restarted in 2022. It involved saliva DNA samples, and there was an outcry from autistic and disability groups about how this data would be used and who was leading the study. The concerns cited were that researchers on the study with previous work um, had work on curing or eliminating autism, which people in the study like who were autistic and might not hate being autistic, if you can imagine it, um, um, were, were, were treated, uh, like, like they were worried that the goals would be cure or elimination just given who was on the research study. And I think that they probably had good reason to think that. They thought that the study did not privilege autistic people's safety or perspectives about the sort of research autistic people would want about autism. And then an additional worry that data from the samples is not properly safeguarded from misuse. Um, so, so worries about how um, data could be bent or misused, uh, but then also released in ways that would um, leave people more vulnerable. There's also been a lot of talk about AI surveillance and education and hiring. So things like I, and facial tracking misread a variety of disability types and suggest um, extra scrutiny. Uh, we know that there are different systems of threat assessment and social media monitoring that take place um, sort of in primary um, and secondary schools, um, but, but are being applied more widely in workplaces as well. Um, and play plagiarism, pl plagiarism and AI detectors often don't accurately track. Um, so a case happened fairly recently with um, my colleague Rua May Williams, um, where it suggested uh, like someone who was corresponding them with them with email was very offended because it looked as if their emails were being composed with AI software, but they weren't being composed with AI software. That was just the way my, my autistic colleague uh, Rua Williams uh, writes and talks. Um, so. It, Sometimes disabled people are read as more robotic or or sounding more like AI in a way that some of these uh, 
some of these pushes to detect this in people's work and their essays is really a problem for disabled students. Um, and we see a greater scrutiny of disabled people and sort of an automatic exclusion from jobs. Here's a headline um, from the Center for Democracy and Technology, algorithm driven hiring tools, innovative recruitment or expedited disability discrimination. So this is all to say um, in our last few minutes that your cyborgs have reasons to be afraid of techno-ableist AI. Second class citizenship means that disabled people are constantly added extra scrutiny and vulnerability and AI, especially in corporate and governmental hands, makes us extra vulnerable to the whims of corporations and of governments who are scrutinizing and who, because of the tropes, view us as moochers or fakers and view everything that, that we're given as sort, of, um, as sort of where we are pity objects and should just be glad to be existing at all. Tropes around fakery influence a lot of the ways AI systems are deployed in the context of disability with EVV and benefits as assessments. Tropes around bitter and pitiful cripples means that paternalism, collecting more data and monitoring your disabled people is seen as acceptable in the context of disability in the way most people would reject it. Tropes around sin suggest that disabled people's extra scrutiny is somehow earned by our misbehavior. We obviously can't be responsible if we ended up as we are, disabled. And also because we tend to think about technologies for disabled people as an unlimited good, we become less careful when it comes to what it means to have your body owned and managed partially by companies that don't have your interest in mind and are subject to market and shareholder interests. Living with and relying on technologies makes us vulnerable in very particular ways, but is, but is intensified in the case of disability. So your cyborg worries are that in the rush to use AI in more places, we need to be increasingly careful. The motto of move fast and break things is a lot less fun when it's your body being broken, when it is your life and livelihood that are at stake. We need more transparency and maybe less data collected and not more, especially when it comes to what is recorded and how it will be used and used against us and who it will be seen by. We need to think about also flexibility of use and, and many ways to do things, uh, functionalities through multiple pathways and backups. Disabled people are rarely afforded backups or planned for in emergencies, right? If you're disabled, oh, there's a fire drill, go sit in this particular stairwell until someone comes and gets you. Even when it comes to getting into buildings, sometimes there's one door um, that some of us can get in and out of. Um, we are not planned for in terms of like, what happens when my prosthetic leg breaks? Well, what happens when my prosthetic leg breaks is I bought myself my own pair of crutches. My insurance did not right? I, I'm not afforded that. And I'm lucky I can afford the things that, that I do. Um, so here I quote from the cyborg Jillian Visa in Common Cyborg. Triborg concerns, that is like non-disabled tech boosters, um, are the Anthropocene texting and networking. But your cyborg concerns are things like, can I afford my leg? Will a stalker, a doctor, or the law kill me? And so I end here um, and I look forward to your questions. Um, thank you so much. You can find me as Ashley Shu with OO instead of EW on Blue Sky and Twitter. Um, the other Ashley Shu got the EW one, unfortunately. All right, I'm gonna stop share so I might see some faces.